Good evening. Welcome to the John H. Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape, and Design. My name is Charles Stankovich. Um, I'm the director of the Visual Studies programs here at the faculty. Um, it's uh, my pleasure and honor to host the evening. Uh, before I do, I want to say a few things about some upcoming events while we have a captive audience. The first is our exhibition downstairs, just below you directly, uh, Nusakadia. It's our inaugural exhibition in the uh, gallery that opened this year, curated by our Dean Summers, and uh, in collaboration with Pillow Culture from New York. So I uh, encourage you to stop by and experience the immersive space if you haven't already. A uh, good time to do that would be this Thursday, where there is a lecture on the politics of sleep, particularly as it relates to uh, activism and the military, which will be taking place inside the immersive uh, felt womb, or whatever adjective you'd like to describe the soft, warm place down there. Um, and uh, we also have, this is probably the busiest week at the faculty. We do a lot of incredible programming through all of our programs. And this weekend, we also have a symposium organized by our professor emeritus, Kim, uh, Lisa Steele and Kim Tomzak. This is called Profit and Loss. So the keynote is Friday um, and all day Saturday um, with some great guests such as Martha Rosler, Jan Vo. Uh, on a bunch of academics pushing their research that they've had for several decades on the overlap between Vietnam, art, and politics. Of course, all of these events are free here at Daniels. Um, and since this evening is part of the Masters of Visual Studies um, series, uh, I want to kind of highlight the last few events that are upcoming till the end of the term. Uh, two weeks from now, we have Philippa Ramos uh, on the 17th of March. She will be speaking under the auspices of the Drowned World research theme of the year, um, which included Marguerite Humeau last month. And her video has been posted on YouTube. So if you missed her talk about deep time and feminism, as well as the post-human, highly encourage you to go to the Daniels YouTube channel um, and watch it there. Um, we also, after that, a week later, have the local curator, Rui Amaral. He's a young emerging curator that has also just been recently named the adjunct curator of the Museum of Contemporary Art here in Toronto, as well as the director and curator since I first started of Scrap Metal, the private art foundation um, that he has two shows on, both actually at the museum and at Scrap Metal. So it's the first time anyone's asked him to really talk about his curatorial methodology. So uh, if you are interested in those shows that are on right now or just interested in one of the rising kind of curatorial voices in the city, I encourage you to come to that event. The end of the month uh, is kind of a special moment in regards to uh, a series of workshops, screenings, and an issue launch, After All Journal, uh, which is co-published by the Daniels faculty in partnership with the Central St. Martin's School in London, Antwerp's Museum of Modern Art, as well as the CCA in Singapore which is distributed by Chicago, University of Chicago Press. We're launching our 49th issue, actually, uh, at the end of the month, so please stay tuned for that. Uh, there'll be some writing workshops, as I, said, as I said before, a screening as well, as the whole editorial team comes to meet and engage with the community. And we'll have visitors from Sao Paulo, Mass Museum, um, London, Zurich, um, and hopefully from Singapore as well, um, pending a few different factors we're all thinking about these days. We'll end the term off with a kind of soft talk in the sense that it's not here um, in this room. All the other events are here in the lecture hall, but off campus at a new space called Sugar Contemporary, um, which is a collaboration between Daniels and Carol Weinbaum, directed by Alushan Zenibanovsky, who's an MVS graduate student currently. Um, and we'll be hosting, she'll be, they will be hosting, I should say, uh, Elizabeth, who's an anthropologist, uh, professor of anthropology and gender studies at Columbia University who's been working for quite some time with the Aboriginal film collective Kerbinga. So there'll be a screening and her speaking, which ends the term in public lectures. And I want to say in close that on April 17th is our MVS exhibition at the Art Museum, which is quite a celebratory time um, as the thesis students show their work at the museum, as well as the undergraduate um, Shelley Peterson show. So please, encourage you to come to all of them. Again, they're free. Um, just show up. We do ticketed events, but of course, there's always a rush line, um, and we're happy to see you uh, at the last moment. Which brings me to this evening. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce the guest. I want to say, first of all, that tonight was only made possible because of the collaboration with the Japan Foundation, so thank you very much, as well as KPMB and Bruce, uh, particularly, for making this event possible tonight. I'm going to defer with the regular introduction uh, or the official biography 
of uh, Yusuke, partly because tonight's a little bit of a homecoming. I think you've already noticed that she's constantly been hugging people um, as a reunion, and it's a little more emotional perhaps tonight for him to be speaking rather than the robotic, automatic lecture one does on the circuit. Um, and so I thought I would talk a little bit about the mythology of Yusuke, or as he was known here, Yusuke, um, uh, in Toronto. Uh, in regards to where he started, let's say, his architectural origins, and let him kind of run away and correct me with it when he gets up on the stage. He has a slightly different education to architecture than most of our students do, in the sense that, um, I hope I'm not embarrassed, he dropped out of high school without his parents knowing, work construction, to save money to come and backpack um, around the continent of North America. So at this time, not speaking um, a lot of English, that he started to engage urban space, particularly the interstitial, um, as a uh, vagabond hitchhiking and occupying and squatting different locations, really understanding architecture from that perspective rather than a top-down perspective. He learned um, that if he wanted to become an architect, uh, he had to enroll in school, so he enrolled at Central Tech, just down the street a couple blocks away at Bathurst in preparation to uh, enroll at the U of T's architecture program. Now this was 30 years ago. Uh, a lot has changed as we've kind of noticed over dinner last night and today walking through the building. Um, and it was uh, at this time, I think we can probably safely bet after last night's dinner that he's probably the first undergrad student that's also giving a marquee lecture. Um, by which I mean he never graduated and he might still be enrolled as a student. We have to check with the registrar to see. Um, and we might have to talk to Bridget after to see if he passes with, uh, with credit based on the projects he's showing tonight. Um, from this, we know that he went to California and the more uh, official bio starts at SIARC in Princeton. Um, uh, there was a little bit of crossover again with the securities passes as the co-director of the DRL, of the Design Research Lab at the AA. Um, I actually happened to be there studying briefly at the same time, so kind of full circle again this evening with all the personal contacts. He went on from there to become the uh, professor, currently associate professor of architecture at Tokyo University where he runs the titular Obuchi Laboratory. Um, I invited him tonight under the auspices of the Masters of Visual Studies program uh, to kind of bridge the gap between the design and the art communities here at the faculty, one of the strengths of the school within the country. And so we're gonna be looking at a few of his projects hopefully tonight that really kind of question basic methodologies and the dogma and a lot of digital computation. Um, and particularly starting with projects like his uh, Wave Garden. Again, kind of fitting into our uh, drowned world theme that the MVS has been running this year on ecology, sustainability, and questions of the post-human. So if you'll please help me in welcoming Yusuke Obuchi. Why do I do this? Oh, here we go. Thank you, Charles, uh, for the uh, introductions. And also, I would like to thank uh, Bruce and then Japan Foundation for making this uh, visit possible. Now, a little correction to uh, his intro. Uh, it's true, I dropped out of high school. And I came to the uh, United States a long time ago. Uh, but what's fundamentally different back then, I didn't speak a word of English. Uh, so I passed through the uh, customs, and they asked me, so why are you coming here? And I say, yes. Uh, do you have any drugs? And say, yes. <laughs> Are you looking for a job in the U.S.? Yes. And so I just say, yes, yes, yes. It's a polite way of saying in Japan, I hear what you say. But I didn't really know. After that, I went straight to um, whatever the different route than everybody else is going. They stripped me down, searching for something. I said, gosh, this is how difficult to get into the United States. So this is back then, so I, hopefully uh, today's presentation is a little bit more coherent than when I went through the immigration back then. Now, uh, today's title, uh, Arms Race, I'm not going to be talking about the military precision uh, arms uh, things. Hold on a second, these things are constantly coming up. Okay, but instead, I would like to talk about the relationship between uh, digital fabrication based on computational processes and also how the capacity of a human can be involved within this uh, production processes. 
I have organized uh, three different uh, topics that I'm very interested in. So I'll quickly go through that topic and then go on to my current project of working at the University of Tokyo. Now, this is an image of a construction site in Japan. This is uh, 19th century, 1880, uh, 1864. Now, today's standard, you look at it, it's like, gosh, you know, these people don't have boots, no hard hat. Uh, but we notice it's quite lively construction site. And also you notice that people are just carrying things uh, by all manual means. And here's the guys with a hammer, and with this guy also with a hammer. Now just 150 years later, not much different. People are still putting pieces together. Yes, got a hard hat, they, you know, they're not barefoot. Uh, but what you notice is this: all of those joints are precisely cut in order for those joints to be fit precisely. So what are the fundamental differences I'm very interested in today's talk? It's not so much about design as how things will look and how things are being used, but more towards how things are being constructed in terms of construction processes. So this is the current version in Japan. All the uh, wooden pieces are precisely cut. Robotically, all these pieces are fitted uh, with uh, military precision, zero uh, torrents. Whereas this is the uh, plan of the drawing that you saw the earlier, which is this is the only drawing that they produce in order to construct most of the building, which is giving where the column would be. Everything else that would be determined by the construction crews. And now there's a term in Japanese called kiwari, which is the proportional system based on spacing of the column. So once they determine that, everything else pretty much automatically decided. Size of the beam, size of the column, uh, how long it should be, all of that. But all of those decisions are pretty much based on construction, based on uh, the processes they go through at the construction site. So this, I guess that I, my argument that I would like to perhaps make today is I'm not saying this is not interesting. I think this is uh, something that we absolutely need in these kind of robotic productions. But this allows for the construction processes to be very creative. That perhaps the design continue not only at the drawing of the plan, but go through the entire fabrication and the assembly processes. So the question is, when does design begin in the end? Uh, I think often we train as an architect to design on the drafting board or in the computer and hand it to the construction crews, then they'll assemble. But is it possible, as I said before, extend these processes, not only limiting what is designed, the, uh, the role of construction is to execute that precise design, or there are a lot of interpretation, a lot of kind of uh, collaboration that happen during the constructions. I'm going to switch back a little bit to where I have been since I left Toronto 30 years ago. And as Charles said, I'm hoping that Bridge and George can give me a degree after this presentation. Uh, so this is uh, after I left, because uh, I was here a third year, I didn't have enough money to go to study abroad, so I decided to uh, go to Los Angeles to do an internship. Uh, so this is the uh, Rotundi's office, the renovation project. I just wanted to highlight what was interesting and perhaps kind of uh, made my foundation in terms of how to design is all of these. This is a very rough drawing that we produced for that house. All these you know, proportional systems and pretty much conventional. But what was radically different is all of those material that you see here are found on the site. So depending on what was the material available, because the client was a construction builder. Does so he constantly collect all the uh, old building materials? And my role is to go and to check what materials are available, number one. Two, he is a contractor himself. So he assembled based on my uh, kind of rude sketches that I gave to him. Inevitably, he alternate what I have given as a construction drawing, because that might be cheaper, easier. So every day I go back and say, no, this is not what we talked about. So at the beginning, it was a kind of constant fight between the architect's client builder. But later on, we decided, let's not fight. Let's just accept whatever he does. 
So it became a kind of negotiation between you go there in the site, six in the morning, talk about, and next morning you go back and say, so what you have done? Okay, this is what you have done, so you just change it to this drawing. So uh, it was a kind of interesting way of design and also the build, but at the same time finding all those criteria, i.e. structural materials and all of those things are being accommodated within the whole process. So this is the site, uh, they're looking down, downtown. This is they found old oil tank that accommodated in design. So it's, everything was pretty much found object. And I just throw this image in so that I was not only uh, you know, giving drawings, but this is myself, this is my classmate, he's not here today, but Scott. Uh, similar, it's a very small site, there's no uh, construction vehicles are accessible, so everything was built by hand, and all these materials pretty much found around that, uh, the site. So again, we made a very quick sketch how things can be put together, but all of those uh, designs are pretty much uh, decided why we are building. Very inefficient, but I found it a very uh, productive way of experiencing the space while we were building. So this is inside, this is 1993. Um, so that's the kind of interest I have, like where the design, the work, uh, begin and end. So the next one is how many people should participate in the designing? Is it just an architect and client? Or it could potentially be everybody be part of the design process? So this is my uh, uh, master thesis project that somehow found its own way, kind of went around the different exhibitions and tours. Uh, so this is the design of power plant. Uh, and back, this is about 20 years ago, so it's now it's quite common to talk about the energy issues and how to engage in social political issues within architecture. But back then, it wasn't. So everybody thought, hmm, why are you designing power plant? Uh, but what was, I thought was an interesting is, once again, the question of who decide what to design and who actually engage in part of the design process. So the idea of this power plant, or we, I call it a wave garden, is to harness the uh, tidal wave on the ocean, just to go back. Uh, so this is uh, California and uh, Diablo uh, Canyon. And there's a nuclear power plant here. So the nu a nuclear power plant has the 35 years of license. So when it uh, finished the license, they have to figure out how to extend it or decommission and found a different source of energy. So I made this large tapestry of this uh, material called piezoelectric that bends, and when it bends based on uh, wave patterns, that kinetic energy transforms into the potential energy, in this case, the electric power. So depending on how f uh, much of the uh, wave is uh, harnessing energy that produce and then also serve the city, um, the Avo Canyon. Now, what was interesting in this material is not only harvesting, converting uh, tidal energy to electric energy, you could apply the energy and then it moves. So between potential and kinetic energy could go back and forth. So during the uh, week, which is most of the uh, energy consumption happens, so this, this huge, large uh, device or tapestry is uh, oscillating to produce energy, but in the weekend, the energy consumption goes down. So whatever the served energy tap goes back into this to create a different shape of the landscape. Oops. So, uh, so this uh, becomes more like a marine park in the weekend, people can go, but the idea is to incentivize people to save energy during a week. So the more energy that's being saved, that can be a kind of uh, feedback into this a landscape. The landscape creates the surfaces for people to use as a potential uh, recreational on the weekend. So it's not like I'm designing a shape of it, but participating in the production of the landscape that could be uh, used by the uh, general public. So this is a kind of finding how many people should be participating in the design and what are the ways in which those can be uh, organized as an architectural forms. 
And also, uh, the third last topic that we'd like to talk about is the design tools. So instead of designing the building and find how to be, uh, build, maybe you can turn it around and say you're designing a design tool through which the, uh, the output, i.e. the design, can be uh, fabricated. So this is the uh, project. Uh, it's called Flux Room. Uh, we work together with Jesse Rise and Nanako Memoto in New York. That this uh, very simple, rather mysterious box is surrounded by this coil. It's a solenoid that's powered by the electric current. So every time the changes in the voltage within this cell, the inside of this box has this uh, 5,000 magnetic needles. So depending on changing the voltage of each cell, this internal space becomes like a fish of scale, if you like. Uh, the kind of moving through. So visualization of the magnetic field and turn that into the spatial quality, but also to use it as an architectural immersive environment. So those are kind of three ideas that kind of allow me to conceptualize what my interests are. And obviously today's main topic is the digital fabrications. And I heard that digital fabrication here is quite advanced. Is that right? Advanced or going up there? Yeah, uh, so uh, this is the uh, quick uh, way to illustrate the uh, state of uh, manufacturing industries as well as the construction industry, how the uh, digital fabrications have affected their GDP. So this is 1995, uh, pretty much this is the uh, manufacturing industry, this is the construction industry. They have doubled in terms of GDP, and architecture hasn't. The reason why, I think because in the site, it's not so always in the uh, uh, industrial processes. So architecture is a kind of trying to figure out how to increase. But in Japan, this is a quick overview for those who don't know uh, the population uh, condition in Japan. So this is uh, 800. Uh, so this is just about, about a decade ago, uh, 2000 population has reached the peak, and this is now the decline. So by 2050, according to this diagram, about 40% uh, percent of people would be senior citizens, over 65. So you can imagine half of the people living in Japan are senior citizens. So it's a very different context that we have to think of how we're going to build and to whom the buildings are designed for. And also a quick uh, illustration of uh, the building industry, how they are doing. The red line shows the actual construction workers in Japan. So the peak is about this 1988, um, when I started here at UFT. Oh, no, yeah, no, it's t 10 years later, sorry. I'm off, I'm way here. Uh, uh, then decline consistently, and this, the green line shows how much constructions uh, say invested it uh, by the economy. So as you can see the kind of declining of it. So how do you deal with when the population declining, when the workers are also are declining at the same time? One of the solutions is this. Perhaps instead of drawing as the first year's curriculum, uh, everybody start to learn how to operate rubber. This is the one way to deal with two issues how to uh, deal with this issue of labor shortage, and also how to increase the productivity based on that. But my talk is slightly different. Are there any other ways than going this path? Are there different criteria that we might be able to use as a way to conceptualize using digital fabrication tool? So I will take you back to, as Charles said, I was teaching at AA uh, for about eight years uh, before I moved on to uh, Tokyo. And I will show you just one project uh, that illustrate to help uh, explaining a project uh, my, uh, my interest. So this is a, a pavilion that we built in 2008. Uh, the material was uh, eight, uh, 12 mil uh, reinforced concrete, and this construction company, they acquire a laser cutter, oh no, I'm sorry, water jet cutter that could cut anything. So they ask, so here's a material that we could provide, here's a tool that we can use, what can you do? And obviously, you had this amazing tool that would cut anything, so I said, okay, let's cut 
to all different shapes possible. Everything is you know, different. You know, I'm sure that you know the term mass customizations. And all the structure can be differentiated. Structure means that they are not continuous. They are like a bicycle chain. So they can put it together, both the structural idea, spatial idea, fabrication ideas, hold together. It's a kind of magic project. And we can cut it down to a millimeter of precision to cut pieces like that to put it together like in a finger joint, like in a 3D puzzle. So I got students to uh, put these pieces together, and they're quite excited to do a kind of hands-on, full-scale project right in front of AA. So we produce a whole set of drawings uh, to see the sequence of what needs to be done, and students are quite excited. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, but slowly we realize that as we built, this is a small scale 1 to 10 model. It took us a two days. And this is how it was being constructed. And because this was built about two days, day and a half, and we thought, OK, maybe two weeks we can put it all together. Just simple, just put it together, no brainer. Turned out to be nothing was simple as what we anticipated. The pieces just don't fit. First iteration fit, but after this, nothing fits anymore. Because we quickly realize there's a difference between human precision and machinic precisions. And humans, uh, the uh, increment, incrementally, the inaccuracy multiply to the point when you get here, nothing fits anymore. So we had to take it down three times. Put it up, take it down, put it up, take it down. And each piece is actually quite heavy, as you saw you know, a couple of people have to carry it together. In the end, uh, we made it, but it took us a three months instead of two weeks. So I got a lot of trouble <laughs> by the places like in AA where tuition is, you know, it's not something that you can just pay. So the student has to commit it day and night to put these things together. So, but it's a learning experience that maybe we have to go through this sometimes. So one is, yes, structural optimization can be achieved with a minimum uh, amount of material, because everything is kind of reduced to the uh, streamlined. And the other one is, yes, there are no extra costs to making those complex geometry with complex structural system. But what was fundamentally different was there's a discrepancy between the machine way of making and the human way of making. So how to synthesize that or how to do either way, human, like in a traditional way, or the machine is totally kind of automated, or there are somewhere in between two. So I moved on to uh, University of Tokyo to set up a course. Um, we call it Advanced Design Studies. Uh, I got a little greedy, uh, so instead of just doing studio, I said, OK, let's start different kind of labs. So sustainable is an important topic. Digital fabrication is important. So all kinds of a lab that I started at. Uh, but today, I'm not going to have a time to talk all of them. So I'll focus on this topic on digital fabrication as the way to, say, argue one of my, my interests. So uh, I'll show you a couple of projects uh, that uh, each project uh, illustrate the problem, but also uh, opens up the new possibility. So the first project uh, is a pavilion project. In fact, all of showing today is a pavilion project. Uh, so as I was saying, how to deal with this uh, issue of tolerance or inaccuracy. And the first, our attempt is to solve through structure rather than through the actual assembly process. So this is a, a tensegrity structure. As you can see, none of those compressive elements are touching each other. So all of them are floating. In fact, this outer ring is where all these pieces hang from. So this is dome structure. In the middle, it's in fact the floating I'll show in a minute. So everything is counterbalanced to create this geometry as if that it's a floating pieces. Uh, I'll skip that. So as, you, as I was saying uh, earlier, so that piece acts as an counterweight, and all of those pieces are suspended from this. 
So by doing this, because in the counterweight, all of those inaccuracy can be, say, compensated, so the place, uh, structure is always it's quite rigid. It's not like rigid, rigid, it's quite s soft, but it's always balanced, uh, even though there are inaccuracy within those uh, tension members. As you know, for those uh, who study on a digital fabrication and also computation design, the whole purpose is how to integrate all different aspects of the design, from structural calculation to component, which is in the geometrical study, to assembly processes, and all of that can be understood as one seamless design process. So uh, I convinced a construction company in Japan, this is uh, Obayashi, to help fund the project, but at the same time be part of our design team. Uh, so there are construction company people come, they're wondering how this can be good for their construction, uh, but they convinced them that this is the kind of new way of thinking about construction processes. So a series of uh, testing. Uh, at the same time, we are not wondering about how to reduce inaccuracy, but different way of fabricating and constructing. So this case, it's uh, almost like a fabric, like a pieces are put together by simply lifting, that will produce a geometry, like in the form finding processes that Frey Otto uh, explored back in the 70s and 80s. So that this get lifted, and then lifting will produce a geometry as the most optimized form and also structures. So some of that. Typically when we design, I think we design for the optimization of at the very end. But because this process is very much how things are being built, requires also understanding how the structure works too. So do quite a bit of simulation of lifting of this tapestry and then when you unload or uh, release it, I produce the form that's both the geometry as well as the final design. So uh, with, together with the student, uh, I have a 10 student comes every year uh, to explore um, different aspects of fabrication. So this is a smaller scale model and then go through the mock-up of that. So I quickly go through. So by lifting, and then it will produce that, the final form. Now, I think typically digital fabrications are making pieces and you assemble. Uh, but in this case, what we are using digital fabrication, it's not only the piece, but also the entire production process for setting up the jig for the attention cables. So some of the drawings. And the scaling up of that tension cable processes, and again, using a laser cutter as a way for getting as accurate processes as possible. So this is the uh, kind of uh, the structural uh, image that shows how its outer rim, that red one, is how a position and yellow is final uh, re uh, kind of settling to create. Uh, this thing is coming up. Okay. So you saw that before. Now, uh, we, in Japan, the architecture belongs to the School of Engineering. Uh, so we have uh, quite a bit of uh, equipment and facility to uh, conceptualize the material that typically not understood as an architectural. So this is a very thin uh, 0 .10, uh, stain, 0 .01 uh, stainless steel. Uh, so we inflate it to create this like a pillow-like but we have to figure out what are the um, young module for that. So we do a crush test in order to find that, that structural capacity. So uh, there's a quick video uh, to kind of summarizing what I have already said. But the whole idea is, one, how the uh, construction processes could be as accurate as possible, but still allowing the uh, self-adjustment. In this case, is using a counterweight as a way to uh, stabilize the geometry. This is the only time that we use the uh, robotics arm. Uh, we don't own it, we don't have it, we don't have a budget for it, so we commission uh, companies to do it, but that kind of skyrocketed our budget, so you'll see later on, we decided not to follow that path. 
So all the uh, pillow is uh, welded together with a robotic arm, the laser, uh, and then inflated with water to create a compression uh, component. And those are put together uh, with the stainless steel cable in a particular order that when you lift it, as you see here, that lifting uh, creates this uh, like a catenary uh, uh, geometry that will produce this final form. So in the construction process here, it's very much the same as a kind of mock-up process, just simply scaling up using by hand. In this case, it's the, uh, using a large crane in order to lift the structure. The only tricky part that we have is uh, we have these two pieces that when uh, lifted, it needs to uh, get stitched together. Uh, so that was relatively easy uh, when scale is it's much smaller. So we hire the construction crews in order to stitch this one of those uh, seam line uh, up in the air to do this. So in tech, uh, this assembly took us about three hours. Uh, the crane came in the morning, they lifted it, and they positioned into uh, those points, which were already determined uh, before the assembly. So uh, the idea is maybe these very loose material could be deployed to different places. All you have to do is to lift it up and drop it and create this uh, geometry. Now, Moving on to a second project, and each project has iterations of learning from the mistake and what can we actually develop and improve the previous uh, the attempt. The uh, idea of the digital fabrication for what I just showed was how not to use the human involvement as much as possible, use robotic, very advanced technology, but we realize that we don't, as I said, we don't have money for it. Uh, it's not as interesting as what we thought, and the most interesting was how the human, as I said, they have to go up in the ladder to stitch them together. So we thought, maybe instead of going to uh, making everything robotically, embrace it with the human involvement. But you also wanted to explore other aspects. So in this case, is the chopsticks. For those who've been to Japan, you know it's very, uh, it's disposable, it's everywhere. Uh, but they're quite good at, I noticed here, that recycling cans and, uh, but they also recycle chopsticks. So if you have an event, there is a chopstick bin and you have to throw that. So you kind of mix the cans and that. So this is actually quite interesting that you can look at the material that in a very different way when you have such a, a large quantity. So once again, you know, learning from the Freyoto's form finding as a way to optimize geometry as well as the structure and also construction processes. So we thought, why don't we conceptualize these comp uh, parts, in this case is a grain, and when you uh, drop it, uh, that gravitational force as well as the uh, angle of repose, which is most optimized angle that we produce, could generate the both structure and geometry at the same time. So this is our kind of idea of how can we use chopsticks to make pavilion. But at the same time, we are very fascinated with the idea of making our self 3D printer. Uh, before it was in robotic, in this case, maybe you can use a 3D printer. But the problem with 3D printer is the output cannot be bigger than the frame or uh, device itself. So how to go different way about making a 3D printer uh, that is, you can print bigger than the object. So this is what uh, we built using one million chopsticks. Uh, and so how, I'll explain in a minute. So this is a, a 3D printed object, uh, but instead of using granule, this is using a chopstick that's not a free material, if you like. Different from granule, if you drop gravel, it always becomes 35.7 degrees. That's just the pure physics. Like all the mountains, like Mount Fuji, you know, they have 35 degrees because it's the nature of material to uh, distribute the matter and such. But chopsticks, if it's not the grain, uh, it's, it's got kind of binding. So if you drop it, you can actually fabricate this without the formwork to a certain point and then it collapses. So 
what we thought was maybe we could uh, mix with glue as you drop to produce this uh, 3D printed. I'll explain in a minute how that might work, but uh, this uh, geometry can be printed uh, 3D uh, without making the geometry to collapse. In this case, uh, this project we work with the Shimizu Corporation, so that we invited these people that this is a future construction process. They're quite suspicious. <laughs> They're not quite convinced about that point. Uh, so then we need to develop, so how does it work? Uh, so we developed 3D dispenser, oh, I'm sorry, a chopstick dispenser. Um, very primitive at this point, and very labor intensive, three people, per this little thing. So this guy's holding this device, and this, the guy in the black shirt, he's cranking, chopsticks will come out, and he's putting, uh, applying a glue while it drops. So, yes, this is just dropping chopsticks, but if you were to coordinate all of that, perhaps we can make a large structure of a 3D printer. So I'll quickly go through so how does this 3D printer work? In this case, 3D chopsticks. So again, we have no money for the robotic arms, so we make our own 3D devices, 3D printer. So this is the very first one, crank model, very analog. You see that series of uh, kind of development, it's motorized, some changes in the feeding system, uh, and got this, then we have this pump that pumps the glue while its roller get uh, kind of sucking all the, uh, the glue. So you could quickly go through. So this is a kind of studio. It's just trying out to figure out this chopstick dispenser that functions. Uh, so this is the final one, quite sexy, I think. Uh, so at the very end, it's got this uh, microprocessors. Understand where you locate and what angle it's dropping, because as I showed earlier, you can print it vertically, or you can print it in an angle. But you cannot quite angle with nothing below, so you have to also tilt this machine in order to control. So this device understands what it needs to be done in order to, and also this hose attached to the glue, so that also control the speed of this motor in order for how fast this chopsticks would drop, and also how much glue should be attached in order for that to be uh, structural in the end. Now, so how does things the whole work? Is this is a, a, a mock-up setup, so it's a, a projector like what we have here, and this is a 3D scanner. Uh, it's all from the uh, gaming industry. Uh, this is uh, Kinect. So the projector project these color-coded patterns, and here's the device in action. Uh, so the green says, "Aim at it." Red means "Do not aim," and purple means "You made a mistake." Now, three, uh, digital fabrication, the rule is there is no mistake. Like in a very early image, that construction site in Japan, if the pieces don't fit, it's out. So you have to get a new piece. So they are either yes or no, or in or out. However, this construction process is hard to say what's yes or no, or right or wrong. Everything can be wrong, and everything can be yes. And particularly this purple part, it tells you this, it's outside of the given geometry that was given as the target. So what do you do? You take out this purple part, and then this part become purple. And if you take that part, this become purple. So it's inevitably the construction processes embracing a mistake as a part of design processes. So what we did was we run through the structural analysis at the same time. So projector will project what, Im uh, what needs to be uh, produced, but 3D scanner is constantly uh, measuring the uh, geometry, run through the structural analysis and see what needs to be done next. So it's a kind of real-time scanning and also printing at the same time. In other words, there is no mistake. The mistake is only the possibility of differentiating geometry, other than mistake needs to be corrected in the very end. Again, similar to the previous one, uh, there is no material as such to make an uh, architecture out of it. So we run through the structural analysis. Turned out to be very soft material. I don't know if you, uh, so because as I said, it's a school of engineering, we have to go through this kind of analysis. 
Uh, so there is no breaking point on that material. It's only get kind of crushed like a sponge. So it turned out to be a good material. So this is the kind of uh, the way that we fabricated it with the projectors and guys. In this case, is aiming in that, in that model. Uh, this is the mock-up that we built. So this is supposed to be a cylinder, kind of pure, but because it went in a different uh, kind of uh, position while students are dropping, structural analysis constantly telling you to go this way. It's like in a car navigation when you're driving. When you wrong, make a wrong turn, it never tells you to go back to where you made a mistake. It gives you new directions. In the same way, this, when you're making a mistake, that calculation allow you to uh, suggest a new uh, kind of potential geometry. So with that, this is the final uh, pavilion that we built in front of our school. Uh, because it's in the public domain, we have to come up with uh, functions. So we said, okay, we're making a bench. Uh, very uncomfortable, turn out to be. <laughs> uh, but uh, kids are happy to sit. Uh, but yes, it wasn't the most comfortable things to sit on it. So that's the, uh, the, uh, the final form. So the idea is, this is when we start shifting from using this shelf fabrication not as a production uh, apparatus, but communication device. So you suggest, and then you will do as best you can, but when you make a mistake, mistake only add to the design quality rather than you be, uh, say, penalized for making mistakes. So depending on who makes it, where it was made, the output is always different, but the output at the same time always optimized, i.e. structurally sound. So we like the idea, it's like, okay, why don't we try out that idea of inclusive way of designing rather than exclusive in terms of how the people's ability to construct it. So this, uh, in the next project, it's not only about, the first one is how well you can aim at this gun, chopstick, shooting gun. Next one is everyone has a different anatomy. Everybody has a different arm lens, you know, uh, different height. But if you to tell people to draw a circle with your arm, everybody draws a circle, but slightly different. So maybe we can give a very simple instruction to people, move your arm like that, move your arm, everything, every, all the pattern can be different, but at the same time could be incorporated into the potential design as an input of differentiations. So there are three students are swinging arms, so you can see different types of swinging, but it's similar, like a circle you can see, it's similar, but it's not identical. So we decided that maybe very simple way is just swing arm like that. And at the same time, we thought maybe we can make an architecture by dancing. All you do is just go up on the stage and dance, then maybe you can make an architecture. I mean, that would be really, really interesting. So there's 12 students with different arm swing patterns organized to create all different differentiated uh, these kind of X patterns. And depending on the combination, we can create a geometry based on the patterns. Now, how do you turn that uh, patterns into architectural building material? So we chose a spray form as tracing this path as a way of creating this uh, material uh, form. So you can see, first one just uh, kind of go out of crazy. But in towards the end, we became pretty good at controlling spray form as a way of making stick. Again, this time we go through the extensive development of how to develop, uh, develop this polyurethane uh, sh uh, spray machine. Uh, so idea for ours is similar to the previous one. So this is a, a target, we call it target geometry. It's like in a destination on your trip, where you wanted to go. So this is where we wanted to spray these pattern to be. I'll show you in the individual piece. But in the end, student actually made a slightly different than what it intended. This is the purple line. So we scan it, run through the structural optimization, and then make it a new target again. And this will repeat it many times. And so there are two uh, colors, pink and the purple, slightly different. So again, here, 
uh, this is what we intended to design or to build based on this spraying form, and this is what it ends in the, uh, as in the process. So it's a similar, but it's close enough, and the structurally both are optimized. And you can see that one huge gadget, which is they lifted it, but they didn't really know which way to turn. Um, so they got a little messed up on that. But again, uh, structurally both are quite optimized. So you can see both of them with, with uh, little red lines. Now the idea for this is, again, as similar to how to embrace with uh, inaccuracy or mistake or people inevitably try, they try to do their best, but perhaps they cannot do the most uh, an accurate form. So that's that. Again, uh, maybe you can turn up the volume of it. Uh, because we thought maybe we'd, like, because there are two persons, so it's like a tangle. It's like, okay, why don't we just do like a tangle dancing? And while we're dancing, the architecture comes in. The so the first is to measure everyone's this swinging arm patterns, and we turn that into a library. And organizing who should go where in order to create this tube. We use a marker, QR marker this time, because the previous project was the projector, and it turned out that projector didn't work during the day. So the, all the project was done in the middle of the night from 7 o'clock to the 7 in the morning. Student didn't like that, so I said, okay, let's not do it again. So we used this, and also, in Japan, above two meters, you have to have a license for constructions. So, that was also the problem for us. So this time, too, okay, let's not do the process that you have to go up. So everything is a light. You build it on the ground and lift it up as you go. So it's like every year, have a little kind of improvement, that problem that we faced in the earlier year, try to get a better version of that. So it's all the, this is 12 meter by 12 meter platform, and the meter uh, increment, this QR code is laid to uh, understand the spatial coordinates in this entire site. As you can see, it's not so smooth dancing. It's a little kind of slow motion dancing. Um, but the idea is that everybody swing this form and make this arc. But if the arc is not as intended, we call somebody else to fit the next pattern. So instead of you change the design, you update the design in terms of structural analysis, but also within the 12 people, we decide who should swing the arm in order to uh, get that ideal form. So this is what I was uh, explaining earlier about the whole kind of, you make it, analyze it, optimize it, you make it, analyze and optimize it. And you go through this in a kind of real time. It's just like the way the tree grows. When tree grows, uh, when the wind comes and get little lame, it never says, oh my gosh, I have to die. I think it will find a way to grow back again. In the same way, this is a real kind of structural analysis built into the construction processes that always output is being optimized. So um, and at the same time, it's quite, um, yeah, I know they are wearing this uh, protective gear um, because we are doing this uh, within the university campus. And uh, because of the lightweight uh, material, so uh, we lift it up and find the kind of right position. Um, but it's a good thing about uh, to be able to analyze the structural coordinate in the real time. So, um, yeah, so this is the before, what it intended, and this is what it came after. But again, who makes it, how it's made it, depending on the weather, all of those circumstances will produce the output that always differentiated and different from what it intended. So it's, it's nice that, like design, perhaps you're not good at design, you're not good at constructions, but you can, or making, but maybe your mistakes are always being rewarded rather than being perhaps penalized. How am I doing my time? Yeah? Okay, I've got a couple more projects, I'll go quick. So we kind of got really into, so everyone is a different, how to maximize the difference 
as a potential design input. And I, uh, as Charles explained, my uh, uh, escape from Japan when I was 17, I didn't really fit into the whole educational system in Japan. Like, you have to do everything the same. I just didn't really like it. I always wanted to do something different, but I get kind of penalized. So this is a great, everyone's different, but how to use the differences positively as opposed to we all have to be the same way. That kind of mass, uh, easy way to say it is it a mass uh, customization, but it's more than mass customization in our case is potentially mass communications that not only producing the differences of so good different, but we communicate it differently. We're all different, so how to produce in a different object or output. So next one is, Maybe everybody have a different strength. Maybe we can really explore the idea of the differences of the strength can be registered and produce an output. So this panel, uh, and we developed this uh, kind of pressure sensor with the glove, it's pushed and then we measure everyone's strength. And then we can see in these numbers what uh, kind of uh, uh, the forces, uh, forces they have. And again, we are interested in material. Uh, the first one that I show you was the uh, chopsticks, and the other one, that, uh, the spray form that was meant to be a uh, bioresin. And this uh, is the uh, construction uh, waste. Uh, in Japan, every material in the construction uh, is recycled, except the wood, concrete, steel, rubber, uh, gypsum board, everything is recycled, cannot be thrown away, but the wood. And so the wood always get chopped up and go to an uh, incinerary plant and get burned. So we got all the material to see, potentially we can give a new life to those materials. But the process is, uh, we have this uh, jig, uh, we sprinkle this uh, chipped uh, construction waste, the wood waste, and then we infuse with resin, I'll show in the video quickly. Uh, but then, idea is that when resin, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not explaining properly, maybe I'll, so you have the jig, uh, and then we vacuum form. Uh, but when you vacuum form, if you take the all air out, it gets really, really tight, rigid, but before, about 10% of air still remain within this vacuum form, is still malleable. That's why the title is called computation of clay. The material behaves like the clay. Maybe the stage of malleability, we can uh, shape the form in certain ways. So this is the uh, chip to the vacuuming processes. Um, again, we're not really interested in the uh, sake of geometry for uh, a kind of, uh, kind of expression of possible computational parametric design but it's rather how to make a very simple geometry that is uh, self-sustained and self-organized. So we want to make uh, this very simple arch as a series of parts that's put together. So the idea is uh, you make one piece, and then based on that, this piece comes in this piece. So now the question is, how are you going to make these pieces? So uh, as I explained, the idea is you push this panel in order to shape this geometry. But at the same time, we thought maybe we are roboticizing people, meaning that it's not maximizing human ability, but we tell people what to do. So I thought, it's not me a, a good things to do. So all we wanted to try is, in this diagram quickly show, is uh, the red part or the pink is to hold it, and this yellow is to push. So you just tell people, you don't have to do, but it just push and pull. And that will give you a geometry that is computationally designed. Typically, you have to shape it to get it right. In this case, series of quick instructions to push that will allow to come up in a particular form. So the construction process is like this. The guy is holding it, and the person is pushed in order to get the right geometry was designed. So how do you do that? So this is a kind of, uh, we have the projector projecting a geometry. And conventional way is the green means you got it right. Red means you are off. So th this case, you can see this part is a little bit off. But typically, you can shape it like, in a, like clay. But we really try to minimize the amount of the input the human has to involve. So uh, 
you push this part or you push that part and you hold the other part that allow you to give the actual geometry that is intended. So this is a kind of the workflow that you design uh, pieces, but you fabricate and then if it's off, it get corrected and then you repeat this again and again in order to get the final geometry. Uh, maybe I'm just giving too much information, but this is what we wanted it, and this is what it ends. Uh, so it's not what it intended, but again, let's not correct mistake. Let's embrace with the mistake that what you made as a part of the design process. I think time is a little bit tight, so I'm going to skip the video of that one, so I'll go next one. So next project, this is the last one, and I hope that we have a conversation afterwards, uh, is how far you can push this idea of everyone is different but embrace as a potential design process. And this time we use hearing as a potential architectural construction, say, input. Now, how do you do that? How do you use acoustic as a potential constructions? So uh, we blindfold and see where perhaps you can identify the source of sound. Because in the one hand, digital uh, fabrication, if you really simplify, digital fabrication is nothing but the giving instruction of the three-dimensional coordinate, like robotic arms. That's what this title is called, Arms Race. It's understanding where the arm should go. At the end, it's, it doesn't matter. It's maybe the brick or glue or whatever. The kind of precise location can be given as in a series of instructions. But how do you do that for the human? visually, in this case, acoustically. So students are blindfolded and see perhaps they can trace the source of sound. So she's blindfolded and person is clicking to see if she can perhaps identify the source of sound. And turn it to be everywhere. Uh, this color identified a different student. It's, it's not very consistent. So we said, okay, let's uh, systematize a bit more. So we develop within the digital uh, uh, environment. So we develop a stereo sound system and the person put the uh, headset like she has and we can identify a source of the sound to see if she can aim at it in the right locations. Turn out to be everywhere again. And why it's everywhere? Because we hear very differently. And so this green means you're actually getting a right aim. Red means really off. So this person, at a certain height above, she has no clue where the sound comes from. Or this person on that person, the right hand is actually no clue where the sound comes from. So it's interesting, like even today, we, use, we think or you think we are hearing the same sound, but in fact, everybody is hearing differently. So again, how to embrace the differences of individual capacity as not only as a passive, but active uh, ingredient for the design process. And also, which it turned out that, like this person was in disaster, has no clue where sound comes from. <laughs> but it turned out that for those who does a lot of gaming, are very good at understanding a spatiality. Or some people don't even notice that they have, uh, say, uh, some injury in their actual hearing, um, but going through this test, we uh, found out. Now, how do you make architecture with all of those analyses? Yes, we understood everyone's different. So we thought, why don't you just develop the shooting device that we can shoot this coconut fiber to make an architecture? So this is the poster that we had. Uh, so this is, we call it uh, Puff Zuga. Uh, so it's a very simple uh, air kind of uh, kind of fan device, and we put coconut fiber. I'm not going to get into the whole detail why coconut fiber, um, but it turned out to be a good material to shoot and make an architecture. So this is the uh, a vision of uh, our pavilion, that this is one ton of coconut fiber, which is quite a bit, supported by this very small uh, 10 to 12 mil steel rod that it's in highest is four and a half meter tall. So obviously, if you're putting one ton, this has to be either perfectly straight and balanced, or this thing will collapse. At the same time, we cannot 
put all of it once. So we have to shoot it and then put uh, the weight in quite in a sequence in order for that to be uh, structurally sound. So this is the uh, kind of final uh, design. The reason why there's a hole in the middle and the reason for this Voronoi pattern is simply because we are shooting from outer rim and also inner rim in order to read. So this is a, a most reachable by shooting. So we shot from here, this is the coverage, that from the coverage, inside and out. And students are giving a set of instruction where to aim acoustically, so no one's looking at it, they're just following, but just like in the gaming. But how do you do this, everyone is so off. So we measure everyone's acoustic perception, that's what we call, and then put that in the uh, structural analysis and say, if this person needs to shoot here, but she's really hearing from there, so the digital will tell you, shoot there. So sh this person, so all the kind of uh, spaces are being compensated in order for that place to be shot in most accurate way. It's not accurate, but it's accurate enough uh, because each of these Voronoi patterns of this is about a meter uh, in diameter. So, uh, so yeah, so, so everybody kind of shooting, but the problem of that is people become good at it, which is a good thing. I think the construction allow you to advance yourself and become good at it, but in this case, it's a problem. We don't want you to get better because we have this already uh, uh, library of your kind of perception of uh, how we understand spaces acoustically. So we run through the machine learning to see if you're becoming good at it, computer become dumber in order to adjust this. So going through this whole process, like everything is being calibrated first as you shoot, and the computer readjusts it in order to accommodate your learning curve. So in, uh, we have the uh, daytime people and nighttime people. Nighttime people go back to the site and measure each column. We had about 128 columns to see if they are, how much they are leaning. Because if they constantly making a mistake, it'll collapse. So in the evening, we go and measure how much is off. And depending on the, uh, how much is uh, tilted in a certain way, we change the entire pattern of shooting. But this pattern of shooting is also depending on who shoots it too. So it's like a, a construction management process on who does it, where it needs to be fed. Um, but this all goes through the real-time calculation as we built. So it took us a 14 days as the final. Uh, so this is the final piece that we got it. You can see a little bit thinner in the top. Uh, we ran out of time, so instead of putting a one ton, got about a uh, three-quarter ton of the coconut fiber. But you can see, relatively, without major disaster, relatively got it, everything right. So let's see if the, uh, this is the final. Maybe you can just turn up the volume bit. The, although the music is nothing important, this is just to kind of give you uh, preventing uncomfortable kind of silence in this whole. Yeah. Uh, we we wear the mask. Uh, it's nothing to do with the coronavirus. Turn up. Uh, just before I came, I gave a lecture just like this to zero audience because the university said you cannot have any audience if you don't have a lecture. So it was a strange uh, experience I had. So this again. Uh, how far you can push the whole idea of embracing uh, differences in human ability in order to use that as a potential design input. So you're not necessarily designing, but you are doing maximum you can, but everybody pitch in a slightly different, say, outcome. Now, this is a pure physics. Uh, you can shoot it actually quite accurately. Uh, but if you're to really aim at it, not visually, through the acoustic, uh, it's always quite a bit off. So again, as I said, every, uh, all the aims are compensated uh, based on one's ability to hear the source of sound. Um, and uh, the shape of that comes through uh, because the particular wing forces uh, that needs to be accommodated in shooting. So the further one is the one, the direction of the wind, so we can shoot further, and the one, the shorter one, is always against it. Um, and everyone, again, uh,
try to kind of uh, listen to the sound source and try to shoot. Uh, and this is the way for making this ceiling. Uh, and also, uh, I don't know if uh, any of you here are structural engineers. It's interesting, this is like a rec old record player structure that because the weight is above and held by this very uh, small uh, column that if you shake it, uh, this uh, weight, because it's so heavy that it doesn't move. So because this place, a lot of kids come uh, during the day, they go like this, so uh, we have to accommodate the safety. But in order to make it really strong that doesn't move, in this case, all the column will move as you shake. But the, because the weight is so heavy, that part is stay in, uh, intact. So this is, you know, I was talking about the shooting that needs to be compensated every day. Uh, so the design is about designing the system rather than designing a final output. However, the final output is pretty much what we design, but it has the quality of the final piece. That's it. Uh, oh, sorry, I had a final image, but it seems to be gone. Okay, thank you. Okay. I hope I didn't talk too long. Great, thanks. Um, does this work? Yeah. Um, we'll get to the question and answer to the floor right away. Um, uh, so I know people can ask questions that they've been wondering maybe uh, about the program or what's happened in the last 30 years. Um, the first quick, easy, and obvious question would be since you're back at U of T, would to kind of take the idea of if you're designing not the objects but the design tools, to kind of look back at uh, we're in educational systems, the same program that you were at a long time ago, what advice would you give to students kind of taking these philosophies as their trajectory through their architectural education or their design education? I mean, other than dropping out, um, of course. Uh, designing tool? Um I mean in the sense of looking at the student as a, uh -huh. as a productive um, engine itself, as a person who has a trajectory. So instead of objects to design tools to the student itself designing their own educational experience, uh -huh. what would be the experience that you would give to someone who's an undergrad in architecture now? That's a long question. Um, um, but I see, this is not answering your question, but I see more and more, uh, like a laser cutter, for instance, you know, I can see, you can cut it by hand very easily, like all the straight line, but they just use it laser cutter for the makings, or sometimes, oh, I couldn't have the model because the laser cutter was down, as if, you know, you could have done it without it. So uh, I think there's a dependency on the tech, opening up the possibility. Uh, so. I mean, I didn't uh, precisely uh, explain this way, but uh, more and more I see where the AIs and all of those technology becoming efficient, you know, high performance, uh, optimized, to the point that all becomes the same because you can actually produce one object, one item that's highly efficient. So I'm adding to the efficiency, but not to reduce the uh, kind of output, but to produce more outcome. So if the advice were, uh, if I can give, is yeah, use technology in an intended way, or tools, I can't say misuse, because I'm sure that there's a shop guy somewhere and said health and safety is not allowed and all day. But uh, you know, just trying to use it in a uh, way that the tool allows the creativity to uh, enhance rather than to diminish, therefore everybody does the same thing. Uh, because I think in the, in the era that we live in, a digital media, particularly with the visual, uh, is so dominating that it has to look in a certain way uh, and also everybody look the same, therefore everybody follow the same. So becoming a lot more homogenized. So uh, I think uh, it's anything that you wanted to do is to uh, kind of express the differences to what we all have. Um, do we have questions um, right away from the audience? 
Yeah, we won at the back. Uh, I was wondering how you approach the group. Like, is it the team approach? How do you select the materials? Uh, interesting. Um, I mean, that would have been like, like a whole lecture in itself. Uh, material, uh, I, I don't know if you noticed that most of the material that we chose are, say, a granule in, uh, in nature, i.e. you can shape it by pushings or droppings. So it's not you have a standard plywood or stock of timber, you cut it, and then you put it together. And what are the kind of material available to behave like in the liquid? So that's the kind of, uh, kind of physical property of the choice of material that we have. But also looking, you know, like we'd like to be part of the sustainable uh, agenda in the society. So look at the material that is, you know, not used in proper ways. So, for instance, I didn't show a whole range of the project, but for instance, you know, we work with a coffee ground, uh, the waste, uh, as a potential material, uh, meaning that how to embrace this waste as a possibility to uh, turn that into construction material. So coffee being turned out to be excellent material for fire resistance. Uh, so what if, if you have this, you know, coffee ground material that covers the entire Starbucks, for instance, you have aromas and everything, but at the same time, fireproof, you know, things like that. So you can look at the social issues, you know, what are the kind of things that it's, it's necessary for us to be part of it, but give a little twist to it so it's not becoming efficient argument for the choice of material, but always allowing for the creativity to... Uh, to take a decision making in the end. I don't know if that answered your questions. Brandon, we have a question. We have a mic too, so you don't have to yell. Um. Am I contaminating them? Yeah. Um, I hope so. <laughs> uh, I mean, the companies are interesting uh, because. It, the company that I show are big companies. These are like the companies that shape Japan, right? Uh, so head of the companies always, they wanted to try it out, all kinds of things. Younger generations, you know, people just went into the office, they wanted to try all these things. But the middle people are the hard one because they don't want to make any mistake. Because they're on this track of, you know, they all kind of, reaching to the top, if any of the problems that they cause, they fall off that you know, ladder. So those are the hard ones. So I have to come up with all these reasons why you know, uh, they have to think in this way. So for instance, I didn't explain this way because if I explain it, it becomes so boring. But how to reduce the matter of the measuring in the constructions, for instance, because near precision so, uh, is, 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 uh, is a critical. So, uh, so issue of measuring structures, but not the structure in this way, but structure is in their terms of efficient terms. So I have three different stories. Story for the CEO, story for the people, the younger one that they're actually working on this, and the story for the middle zone that they have to understand that it's worthwhile for them to invest in such a project. But it's not easy, though. Other questions? We've got one over here. Hi, George. Hi. I mean, it's very intriguing, and I, I don't c pretend to completely understand it, but, and there's a your char characterization of the kind of contingency and variability to do with the different people raises the question of agency. But I have, I got the impression that there's lots of agency for you in these exercises. It was not so clear to me what the degree of individual agency for the student participants in these exercises was. Could you say something about that? Yes. Um. This, uh, I have a program which is a two-year program. Sorry for those students, they just have to deal with me for two years. Uh, so they come in, uh, immediately they participate in this project, pavilion project, without knowing anything about how things are being designed. They, are, they come and design that was done by the previous year student. So they, they become a part of the whole constructions, but 
One of the ambition is how to design or how to uh, develop the uh, construction processes that can be uh, operated by anybody. It doesn't have to be skilled worker, but anyone could be myself or some you know, high school student, everybody could participate. So it's a good trial to say, you come into the program, follow the process and make it. So they are almost like specimens. You know? they, they become experimentation. At the end of the construction, they all said, this worked, this worked, this didn't work, this didn't work. So they all go through evaluation to see what needs to be improved for the next run. So for instance, when you use the visual uh, projection system, it didn't really work well. In reality, it worked well in, in, in the studio. So they said, okay, let's do other way. So all of the processes are evolving each year. So the student inherit from being part of the making, and they analyze what they have done, and then come up with the next one. So there's very kind of consistency in terms of evolving from one to the next. Now, that you are, George, your question is, aren't you tweaking any of those things? Definitely. Um, I think it just needs to be guided what is interesting, what's not interesting, uh, and also fitting that agenda of how uh, the human, you call it agency, human input, could become the uh, driving force for the final output. But in terms of the Aesthetics in a certain kind of formal language is yes. Uh, uh, it follows, I mentioned a couple of times, this whole, you know, Freyoto's whole form findings and geometries are based on optimizing based on the structural system. Yeah, so those are kind of, we gave the whole, you know, seminars and all that, the kind of uh, language of the formal, uh, you know, geometries. Uh, but I try not to say too much in that, but. I do have to kind of tweak it here and there in order to get the output. If I could just a follow up. Does, does, does this imply that from time to time, as you're doing these, that you have, given the, 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 some degree of unpredictability of the end result, that you have to kind of make radical steps m midstream in order to rescue the result? Uh, I did sometimes, I didn't. So for instance, it's the computational clay, that one that the guy, the whole idea is how to just, not giving a shape that you have to you know, make that geometry, but very simple kind of push and pull that you can come up with a geometry. Uh, it's, it's, I said it in a very easy way, but it's not easy. It was done by computer scientists to see if you hold it here with a certain force, if you held it, and you can actually make the, you know, accurate geometry. Now that project, because so complicated for that, the component production, final geometry became a little sad looking in the end. It's supposed to be a bit dramatic and like kind of like a wow kind of thing, but kind of little, you know. So you could have said, no, this is, let's do it again, but so this is an interesting learning that if you run through, this is the form you got. Uh, so I did not for that one, um, uh, say, let's do it again. Where isn't that the one that I show you at the uh, AA model? That was just up and down, up and down. We did it for so many times, and everybody got so tired of it. Uh, but there's a part that you, know, you control, and there's a part that let's take the whole input by everyone, the participation, as, but, uh, as, as in the final form. But it's funny enough, because I'm looking somewhat outside, but for those students who made it, they're all happy with the outcome. It's not exactly how they made it. So this is a kind of, uh, indirectly I am implying the idea that how do you make this whole uh, uh, a production that gives a meaning for the, uh, the things that you make, i.e. how to go beyond the consumer model that we constantly consume in architecture because it has no value except things are just there versus you have attachment to it, you, you put your thoughts and energy into it, the things become meaningful. And in that case, maybe the building could actually use longer, could be used in different ways. So how to create the value more than just you know, good looking, expensive material versus you are part of the whole construction. And then even the output is not so beautiful, maybe uh, you like it. 
I'm wondering if, if you could maybe take further the question. This is a, I think it's an interesting question in regards to design tools and agency and the human centric. It's kind of a goes right to the point. If you could talk a little bit maybe what you see as the difference between design and craft. Um, you know, part of the whole philosophy you're talking about, you bring up Fryato several times of, of form finding, but something, let's say, like um, Kintsuki or the, the ceramic, Japanese ceramics, where you repair and it's through the repair that you actually appreciate the history of the object right. and the story, right. and it becomes more meaning through the right. correction of mistakes or breakage. Right. Um, is, you know, is there a sense of craft versus the design of the algorithmic or the process orientated that makes sense in thinking about your process? Right. Um, simple way, I think some of us call it you know, digital craft. Uh, I'm sure that you have heard that term. Uh, my approach is slightly different than that one. I think the craft requires certain skill set that you have to train yourself, you have to be really good at. And of course, as you practice, as you engage in making, you become really good at it. Uh, so that's the kind of craft is more acquired knowledge that you could uh, express through the you know, shaping the material in a certain way. What we're doing is in fact very amateur. Everybody can participate in making but nobody really wanted to make in a building that potentially caused a problem, structural failure. So all of those things that may be hard part, computation can help to guide you so that in the end, it does not cause you know, a, a problem, but you can still be part of the productions. I think the craft is rather small maybe, but when you make in a, in a building, you don't want to give you know, skill saws and hammers and material to your kids and say, okay, let's make in a tower, let's live there, you know, but it would not be great that anybody could, in fact, participate uh, to make their own place to, you know, live or, but how, how do you do that? I mean, this is where all of those difficult part, i.e. machine learnings and all of the structural calculation, geometrical analysis, and all of those, I'll just give it to the computer. And humans are the ones that enjoy making. It's the other way around from conventional digital fabrication, which is you, uh, you do the easy part, uh, uh, but it's, no, I'm sorry, you do the hard part first because you have to learn all these things. You become expert on programming and everything, operating robotics, and the machine will execute that. Versus like a shooting, everybody can, everybody knows where the sound comes from, but maybe they cannot accurately shoot. So machine learns your uh, kind of capacity and then adjust to that. So, it's like, so that's what we always say there. Let's do the, let's make the system, the computer do the hard work, you do the a fun part, you know? So architecture becomes uh, entertainment. Do you have a couple more questions? Yeah, one in the back, we go. Hi, uh, thank you for your very delightful presentation. I have a very uh, quick question to ask. It's, it's, I'm just very curious about, have you patented the sexy chopstick uh, dispenser? How, uh, sorry? Have, did you patent? Oh, did I patent? The sexy chopstick dispenser. Uh, yeah, we didn't. Because now there you, seems to be a me, potential yeah, market in at least uh, East Asia. That's true. However, uh, uh, in our project, because we, uh, all of those, like I, I showed in a kind of very simple way, but it's, it's a lot of people involved uh, from universities. So computer scientists, structural engineer, material scientists, and us. We are the kind of you know, kind of a non-professional one, almost like dreamers. Uh, but each discipline will write their uh, research paper. So the computer science, we use this as a base and then write in a conference research paper. Structural engineer, they write. So out of the one single project, we typically produce full research paper out of it. And the research paper is as, uh, as good as a patent because all you wanted to do is you did the first and everybody actually be, you know, learn or gain the knowledge from. And the difficult part of patent is very expensive. 
Uh, so we, in fact, negotiate with the university, uh, but they said, no, it's too expensive. And very little potential for that investment to get a return. So instead of going that kind of uh, try to you know, make money out of it, we, we decided to uh, engage in more academic field. Um, is there one last burning question? Yeah, let's end with one. Hi, uh, I really enjoyed your uh, presentation. Um, I'm just wondering, moving forward um, in, in the course that you're, you're teaching, will you be, uh, with the climate change and all the weather disasters and everything, do you think that your course would be, like in the near future, would sort of um, investigate uh, design and technology and building that would withstand all these natural disasters that we're experiencing, like even now? What, what do you see the, your course as being like in the, in the future? Where, where is that taking? Uh, where is it us? taking? Yeah. Um, I didn't show uh, the one that we're currently working on, but uh, again, I think the our point is more, uh, we are all different and how to embrace the differences of the possible design. So I don't know how that fits in uh, climate change and all of those environmental issues, but uh, given uh, the context in Japan, uh, for those who've been to Japan, you know, uh, it's quite tropical. People even though think you know, Japan is in a tropical climate, but uh, you know, buildings are designed for summer, not for the winter. I think here is a different. I think the building here is designed for the winter. There is more uh, uh, in the summer context. Therefore, the whole issue of engaging with the natures and all of that is come through not philosophical, but through the climate issues, how buildings are all designed and such. So I think the climate issue could be highly politicized, you know, kind of climate conditions how to prevent, how to you know, be prepared for. Or I think we could all, again, not to, uh, how to eliminating those as a negative factor, but how to embrace it in order to uh, use it as a possible design input. Uh, so that's why I think a Japanese architecture is often interesting because uh, because they understood this uh, dynamic forces as not always design input. So how to be part of the, you know, nature as opposed to, you know, separate them, resist them, you know. So, I mean, this is a bit abstract way of saying it, but I will always like to use the term of those natural input as, a, as a potential parameters. You know, if the raining's really hard and, you know, all these floodings and all that, you could, you know, you can prevent it, you know, but maybe you can come up with very different, you know, if I'm saying it, uh, very uh, uh, irresponsibly, but maybe your houses, you know, will drift around when you know flood comes. I don't know, but you know, you can come up with a different uh, kind of solutions based on the context. Uh, Great. Um, it's late into the evening, so I want to thank you again for your very imaginative lecture, um, and I uh, hope you'll come back sooner than thirty years. Thank you. Thank you.